Blood transfusion is an indispensable component of healthcare. It contributes to saving millions of lives each year in both routine and emergency situations, permits increasingly complex medical and surgical interventions, and dramatically improves the life expectancy and quality of life of patients with a variety of acute and chronic conditions. Patients who require transfusion as part of their clinical management have the right to expect that sufficient blood will be available to meet their needs and to receive the safest blood possible. However, many patients still die or suffer unnecessarily because they do not have access to safe blood transfusion. The timely availability of safe blood and blood products is essential in all health facilities where blood transfusion is performed. But in many developing countries, there is a widespread shortfall between blood requirements and blood supplies. How do we change the narrative in this part of the world? That's our focus on this week's episode of Health Options. Cardiopulmonary resuscitation, CPR, is a life-saving technique that is useful in many emergencies such as a uh, heart attack or near drowning in which someone's breathing or heartbeat has stopped. You will get to learn how to perform CPR if you join us on our complimentary segment. This is Health Options and I thank you for joining us on the program. I am Rabi Abdullah. Let's take a look at this box pop on Nigerians and voluntary blood donation culture put together by Salwa Ibrahim Khalil. Personally, I'm against donating for people I do not know. No, I never donate blood for my life. Why? I don't want to lose my blood because I'm not getting money to replace it back. Maybe subsequently I might do it, but for now, yeah. I don't think I have enough blood for that. They say that if you, the more you donate, is the more fresh one comes in. Maybe with time, I will get to try that, but I've not given it a thought for. Well. When I donate, the following day, I sleep like a baby and I wake up like a baby. It's always good for me to do. And my inspiration is putting smile on somebody's face. There's a need to sensitize the people and they need to voluntarily go out there and offer to donate this blood so that it is kept there safe for when the need arises. Welcome back. If you're just joining us, this is Health Options, and we are taking a look at safe blood transfusion and sufficiency. And uh, joining me for the discussion, is the National Coordinator, National Blood Transfusion Service, Dr. Omale Joseph Ahmedu, MNI. Glad to have you uh, join us on Health Options, Dr. Ahmedu. Thank you, Rabbi. Blood, 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 one critical element for human survival. Let's start, you know, from the basics now. How important is safe blood? Thank you very much. Um, like I have said, blood is life. And everything about every human being depends on blood. We require blood to transport oxygen, which we breathe in, to help the system in its uh, processes. We also need blood to transport carbon dioxide from the inside outside, which is a byproduct of metabolism. Um, the entire body system and all the major organs of the body depend solely on oxygen to survive. So blood is life. 
and therefore we require a very safe, high quality blood to get the system going. Can you enumerate some of those emergencies that require uh, blood transfusion? Thank you very much. Um, blood is required in virtually all aspects of emergencies, um, but specifically let's look at uh, many of our women who deliver in hospitals and bled a lot. Mm. Without blood, they can survive. So we require them for uh, maternal survival. We also require them for sickle cell disease, anemia, which is also very common in this part of the world. Uh, we require blood for road traffic accidents where people bled to death from various parts of the bodies. We require blood in cancer treatment. We require blood in these days of um, insurgencies, um, healthmen, farmers clashes, uh, communal clashes, political clashes that, that get that to injury of, the, of, the, of those that participate. So blood is actually required. And even in routine surgeries, for obstetricians, when they go for CS, you have to get blood in place for them to do surgery. And uh, these are all sort of areas that blood is needed. But again, we have a very big gap in terms of blood requirement in Nigeria today. Wow, how big is the gap? Oh, well, it's really very big because um, Nigeria requires a minimum of 2 million units of blood per annum. Uh, but right now, what we have is just under 500 units in a, in a year. Mm -hmm. So the gap is really very much. And the reason being that people um, have a series of um, feelings towards donating blood. And the uh, donated blood by way of non-remuneration or free donation is actually the best form of blood that we look for. Um, again, if you get to many of our health facilities, you see people have replacement donation. When people's relations are in need of blood, that's when they go to the hospital to donate blood, which is not good enough. Of course, nobody prepares for emergencies. Mm -hmm. But because emergency comes at each point in time, there's a need for every government, every uh, organization to get ready to handle emergencies as they come. And that's why National Blood Transfer Service is in place to ensure that the Nigerian government has put in place this structure, this, this, this agency, to make sure that we regulate, we coordinate, and we ensure the provision of adequate, safe quality blood for Nigerians at, each t at any time, any point, point, at any point in time. And when that is done, if you have a relation who is in the hospital, you don't have to worry about getting blood for the person because the blood is already available, made available by Nigerians who donate blood freely. Okay, L let's uh, focus our attention more on the voluntary blood donors now. Very, very essential. Who should donate blood? Anybody who is in good health between age 18 and 65 should donate blood. Um, any woman who is not within her period or who is not um, uh, uh, breastfeeding, or who is not um, having any medical condition can donate. And the women donate three times in a year, and men donate four times in a year mm. on three monthly basis. For those who come forward to, you know, to donate, and those who are averse to eat, what are some of the reasons you've been able to, you know, because not everybody is too forthcoming with that. Mm. I think some people don't really understand why they should donate. They don't feel that it's important for them to donate just for no reason. And some believe that in their tradition, they don't donate blood to people and that blood is so sacred, sacred that they don't donate blood. Um, so I may feel that if they donate blood, they will become incompetent in probably in terms of their family life, in terms of their social life. So people have all sorts of myths and misunderstanding of why they should donate blood. But again, blood is a very safe commodity which um, can be uh, used to save life. And so people should um, really believe, I mean, understand that when somebody is losing blood, that person needs to be revived. And the only way the person can be revived is to give blood so that that person can be saved. So. The voluntary donation which we preach is to ensure that people actually understand the need to save other people's lives and voluntarily come forward and donate without being coerced. Okay, there's this misconception too that has to do with uh, people thinking that uh, if they give out, it shortens their own <laughs> blood. Meanwhile, <laughs> when you shared, from what I was made to on the calm of voluntary blood donor, when you right. shared, yes. you know, it gives you the opportunity to re regenerate. That's right. So can you enlighten Nigerians on that? Yes, that is very important because, you know, ordinarily the blood cells in our system they last for about 120 days. After this, they expired and they get dissolved and get into the system so that new blood can be manufactured. So people who donate blood, they actually renew their blood system. Because the more you donate regularly, the more your system becomes fresh because you are beginning to bring in fresh blood into your system. And uh, they, those that donate, they are much, much healthier. And uh, because of their 
uh, I mean, frequent donations, they are also able to avoid some high risk, uh, uh, um, high risk attitude that will cause their system and their health to, to that will affect their health. So, and and that is why those who donate frequently, they are in in better health condition. Mm. Uh, they they, avoid they are more, they are more uh, priority to their health status yes. because screening has to be done. That's and right. a lot of things could be picked if there's anything wrong That's in right. the process. Exactly, exactly. Okay. Then um, Nigeria is a developing country and in my you know introduction I had said that um, there's a huge gap you know between uh, supply and demand. Okay. And uh, here what what do we find here? Is it a question of uh, because we're talking about not just sufficiency now, but mm. safe blood. Mm. Can you share, you know, our own scenario? What does what is playing out? Um, thank you very much. In this part of the world, majority of the blood units we get are from commercial vendors. They are from family replacement, so they don't really go through a process of proper screening. And most health facilities they use rapid screening. And when you use rapid screening, it doesn't give you that quality of blood you require. So what WHO has recommended and also is working the world over is the use of ELISA or high tech, uh, like um, in the use of an architect, uh, 1000 about machines or maybe PCR, which will give you a high quality blood. So once blood are not properly screened of uh, uh, transmissible infections, definitely they are not pure. So what WHO has recommended and what we are processing in Nigeria is to ensure that the four common infections, uh, transmission transmissible infections such as HIV, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, syphilis, malaria, in some countries, sugar diseases are all screened so that the blood can be safe enough. So we're talking about safe quality blood to be available to Nigerians and that's what, what we're doing in NPTS. You can imagine what is happening at the, at the, at the war front by the, at the military uh, end. Uh, it's really in the northeast, but insurgencies. Yes. In fact, some of these uh, our army officers they die because there is no available blood for them at that point in time. So people need to come out and the neighbors so can store them for use when they are required. Hmm. We have some uh, who are championing this cause, the likes of Nathan. You know, he's the highest blood donor right. in the country, and right. he's, uh, he's still a young man. And yeah. you know, we, we showcase him as as a champion in that regard. But beyond that, what will you be saying to? people who are eligible, you know, to donate? Really, Nathan uh, and, and other young Nigerians have actually sacrificed a lot. Nathan has donated about 67 times. Other donors have donated 65. In fact, in Lagos, mm. you'd, be, you'd be surprised that somebody has already donated about 100 times. Mm. So again, the advantage we have in Nigeria is that we have a large population mm. of the youth. And these are the people that should actually come to the aid of MBTS so they can donate blood. In fact, between, like I say, between age 18 and 65, even if we look under 50, in fact, over 50% of Nigerians are within that age group. So if the youths from all over the country are able to understand the need to donate because they want to save a life that they don't even know, then we're good to go. Which of the blood group do you use, you know, uh, uh, it's mostly scarce to get? And what will you be saying to those, you know, who belong to such blood group in terms of stimulating their consciousness to become voluntary blood donors? Well, you know, you never can tell who will need blood. There are people who are in blood group A, some in A, B, some in O. Now, of course, blood group O is a university mm -hmm. donor. Sorry. And People really go for that, and we are working on the um, the hospital uh, 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 medical personnel to use what we call the appropriate clinical use of blood, so that give blood that is available to those who that actually um, uh, need those blood. For example, if you have blood group B blood positive and uh, you have B positive being donated, instead of going for the O, which is universal donor, they should use B for those that are in B. Of course, we have, we have some red blood group like A negatives. Mm. So those who are either A negative or B negative or, or O negative, negative, they should come forward and, uh, and, and be on standby, not necessarily donating. If we have them and have their register and know how to get them, any time to get them, it's important for us to have them on our records that when those groups actually need blood, they are very scarce blood groups and we can always call upon them to come and donate for, for, for their need. The blood we um, assess today are whole blood. But the better prices now are having blood components, either in form of plasma, in form of platelets, or in form of any of the component of blood which the patient needs. In this case, like when you are managing cases like sickle cell 
or cancer or any other disease apart from losing blood volume, you can use any of the components to, um, to, to, to treat the patient. And what we are doing at MBTS9 is to go into the production of blood components. And beyond that, we also intend producing plasma drive medicinal products, which are also on themselves drugs. Mm -hmm. So most of these red drugs are used for some of these rare cases like cancers. They are actually manufactured from blood products, and Nigeria can do it. And once that gets into it, of course, it will be a sort of even revenue generation for the country. Okay. On a final note, now, can you just share with us some of those uh, local foods that we could readily take to boost our uh, blood level? If any, anyone who is actually having a normal three square meals and eating well, definitely will have is the, the, the blood pressure going on. But of course, we encourage eating a lot of vegetables, a lot of fruits, eggs, um, guava, banana, plantain, um, and all this. These are all in, um, all food so that can contribute to the, the, the uh, boost. to boost the immunity of the system, okay. boost vitamins, and boost ions that we encourage the manufacturing of blood cells and blood, other blood what uh, is components. What the place of water in, in all of this? Oh, water is the mother of the body itself. Because even the blood uh, product, the blood component we're talking about, they are all in water, so the plasma. Plasma is the liquid that contains the blood uh, cells, the blood salts, the blood ions, the blood uh, uh, vitamins, and the rest of them. So water is very important for every human beings. And that's why when a donor come to the blood, we encourage them to donate, to take water, a lot of water, so they can replace the volume that is being that's been removed uh, in terms of uh, uh, giving out the blood, uh, unit of blood. So as they drink water and other liquid, uh, they tend to replace um, the volume of blood in their system, okay. which is very critical. All right. Thank you mm. so much, Dr. Amedu, for joining us on Health Options to discuss this very important uh, issue. Thank you so much for coming Thank on. Thank you, Radha. someone suddenly suffers a heart attack in your presence, what first aid knowledge do you have that can save the situation? Next on our lineup is how to perform cardiopulmonary resuscitation, CPR, on a victim of heart attack or similar emergencies. <music> As we all know, cardiac arrest uh, can occur in anyone. Um, and most common cause generally all over the world is uh, related to <coughs> cardiac issues. People who have a weak heart from whatever cause. But it's not only the heart that can cause arrest. Uh, things like drowning, respiratory failure, or anything that overburdens the cardiovascular system can lead to arrest. The question is, what do you do uh, when you see such an individual? The 60 years of cardiopulmonary resuscitation. So it's been a long, long, many years. Unfortunately, for those of us who live in the third world, we still haven't uh, developed systems that can reach everyone when somebody suffers a cardiac arrest. The most important thing in cardiac resuscitation is time. Time is life, time is muscle. When you witness somebody uh, who has suffered a cardiac arrest, you need to make a prompt assessment to see whether that person is actually breathing or not. If you are alone, the best thing you do is to call for help immediately and then approach the victim. Once you determine that that victim is not breathing, in the past we had a sequence of airway, breathing, but now that sequence has changed. The emphasis is now on CAB, which is compression, compression, airway, and breathing. I'm passing through and I just see somebody slumped on the floor. The first thing you do. Hello? Hello? Are you okay? Are you okay? Ah, this man is not, it's, it's not breathing now. The first thing you cup your hand like this and you. Press the chest. See how I'm pressing it? Each time you press, you lift your hand so that there'll be recoil. And you get a good depth. You do this 30 times before you give a breath. 30 times. See, you have to do that. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. 
10, you get that up to 30 and you give a breath. As you are doing that, maybe you are lucky somebody, a passerby will come through and help you call the emergency response team. And once they come, as you are doing this also, because we don't want you to interrupt compression as much as possible. This is the, this is the key to resuscitation. You keep doing that and somebody will bring that machine here, this machine, bring this machine, put the parts here, and then immediately it will tell you whether that person's rhythm is one that can respond to this. And once the machine is automatic, it tells you what to do. You put this on the chest and you look at that, it says shock. You press this button. And then, you, you, and then once it does that, you continue the compression. Continue the, don't stop. Continue, and then you'll be looking at the rhythm. This is also a monitor. It will tell you whether the normal rhythm has returned or not. And then you look at the patient, he's making movement now. Blood pressure is good, everything is good. The rhythm has returned. The next thing is to take this patient to the nearest healthcare facility. And there are other things you do beyond this. If, you sh if the patient is somebody who drowned, the emphasis on this will be less. The emphasis will be more on continuous compression and providing ventilation to that individual because the, the reason for arrest is different in somebody whose arrest resulted from a bad heart or somebody who drowned or somebody like who's been exposed to certain chemicals and they have respiratory arrest. They're totally different. But compression is the key in any of those situations. You keep compressing, interrupt the process as little as you can. Keep making sure that you have a good depth and a record like that. You keep doing that, keep doing that, keep doing that. This should be learned by everybody. Can we, don't go beyond 30 pounds? No, 30, when you do 30, it's as followed by one breath, a ventilation. However, if the medical emergency team arrives, they're usually more than two or three, not just you. That helps because somebody else will be doing that. Somebody else will try to get the airway. And when the airway is now in place, there will be less reason for you to be ventilating that individual. And the process will be, emphasis will be more on compression, the uh, good quality compression. You understand? And then since there are more than one or two, Somebody will be calling for help, somebody will be getting access, somebody will be intubating, and you continue the compression. But the key is good quality compression and early use of this machine. So you keep doing that for a reasonable amount of time, I and mean, this person doesn't respond, um, that's not the end of it. Because <clears throat> if the person responds, uh, depending on what the response is, the care continues after that. Because we now there's what we call advanced cardiac life support system as well, which is also part of uh, the CPRs. CPR is the basic thing. And then once that patient, <coughs> once you determine that the patient's response is either way, these days there's something we call cerebral cooling, where that patient's brain is cooled below a certain temperature. So that you know when the temperature is below a certain level, uh, the damage to the brain cells is minimized. So that's also part of it. And then if this CG shows you there's evidence of damage to the heart muscle, the next thing will be to take that individual to the laboratory where uh, we can do some tests called an angiogram to determine if there has been a blockage. Because if there's a blockage, the heart muscle doesn't get enough blood supply, you can arrest. And that can happen in your sleep, it can happen unannounced. If that is the case and we can get to that individual quickly, that artery can be opened. Once you restore blood flow to that heart muscle, you've seen an, an improvement. That does it on this week's episode of Health Options. A quick reminder that you can go to our YouTube channel to watch the uploads of these and other episodes of the program. Email us for your comments and contributions at healthoptions at nta.gov.ng. Don't forget to join the noble team of voluntary blood donors because you never can tell who might be needing it, when and where. I remain yours, Rabi Abdullah. Thanks for watching. Hope to see you again. Thank <music> you.